scripture is James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion is that pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. You may be seated. As we get started, let me pray for us. Father, as we begin our time, we bring before you the various things that have been going on and are going on. We, we thank you for the youth camp that has just finished and the time the youth could spend together. We pray for John, who is going to be preaching at Christ City, Surrey, in just a, an hour. We pray for the kids camp that is starting tomorrow. And we, con- we pray for continued discernment as we pray for the direction for our urban chapel. And Lord, as we pray for our time together now, for us upstairs and for the kids downstairs, and for all these things that we bring before you, would you receive glory as you make us whole as your people? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Sam. I'm one of the team here. Just one thing, uh, as we get started, we have Bibles at the Connect table. That's the table at the far corner back there. If you don't have a Bible and you want to refer to one during, um, as, during this sermon, can go for, uh, feel free to go and grab one. And if you don't have a Bible of your own, feel free to take one home with you. It will be our joy to have that as a gift to you. And speaking of gifts, let's get into our sermon for today. Giving gifts to children often involves three stages, at least three stages. There's the buying of the gift, there's the giving of the gift, and then especially if you're the parent or a doting uncle or aunt, there's the guiding them on how to use the gift. Sometimes you give the child a gift and they're excited to receive the gift, but then you see the confusion on their face because they don't know exactly what the gift is. And they know they need to be grateful, but the confusion is clouding the gratefulness because they, they don't know what to do with it. And so you need, they need to be guided, don't they? That's a water gun, and you fill it with water here, and the water comes out here, and yes, if you point it at your face, the water will hit your face. (laughs) That's a Lego set, the pieces fit together like that, and if you leave the pieces out, it's going to be painful when you step on it. That's a board game, that's how it, there are rules, and yes, there will be winners, which means that there will be people who don't win, And that's okay. (laughs) As the person who has experienced using the gift, you guide them in how to use the gift. And that's what's going on in our passage for today as we continue in our series in the book of James. James, the writer of this letter, is the older, more experienced brother in the faith, and he's guiding other Christians on how to use and live out this gift of faith they've been given in Christ Jesus. This section is part of the bigger picture of James's letter. If you recall from our first sermon in the series, James's letter can be described like this, the words of Jesus in the voice of wisdom to make us whole. The words of Jesus in the voice of wisdom to make us whole. And as part of this roadmap that James lays out for us on making our lives whole, he guides us in this section on what genuine faith looks like and how to use and live out this gift of faith that Christ Jesus has given us. And he guides, our, he guides us in three ways in our passage, hearing and speaking, hearing and doing, 
and thinking and doing, hearing and speaking, hearing and doing, and thinking and doing. So to our first point, hearing and speaking, look at verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Some verses in the Bible need work, hard work to unpack and to understand. But then there are other verses in the Bible that are just crystal clear from the first time you read it. There's no no need for debate. The meaning is abundantly clear in the text. And verse 19 is one of them. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. But just because it's clear doesn't mean it's easy. Many of us have the tendency to the opposite, don't we? We are slow to hear, quick to speak, and quick to anger. But we need to be clear here, James isn't saying that we should never speak. There are times when it is wise to stay silent, but there are times when it is important that we speak, when we need to speak up. James isn't saying that we should not speak, he's saying that we should be slow to speak and controlled when we speak. He's echoing the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. We see that in 1019 of the book of Proverbs. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Or Proverbs 13 verse 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Running off our mouths is often a recipe for disaster. And so James writes with abundant clarity, be slow to speak and be controlled when we speak. But James doesn't stop there, does he? He goes on to say to do something interesting. After telling us to be slow to speak, he goes on to tell us to be slow to anger. It isn't enough to be slow to speak. James wants us to get to the root of the problem. And the root of, our, of the problem isn't our mouth, it's our hearts. Our mouths are connected to our hearts. It is out of the overflow of our hearts that our mouths speak. When we say something we shouldn't have, the main problem isn't that we said it is that the thought was in our hearts in the first place. If a person says, I don't respect you, the root problem isn't that they said that, is that in their hearts, they genuinely don't respect you. It's like the water supply in our houses. If the water is contaminated, we should start by turning off the tap. But until we get to the root of the problem, whether it is the reservoir or the water treatment plant or the piping, Turning off the problem, turning off the tap doesn't solve the problem, it just limits the problem. It's the same thing with our speech. It's important to be slow to speak and controlled when we speak, but until we get to the root of the problem, the reservoir of our hearts, until that reservoir is aligned with God's heart, the problem is still there and the damage can still be done. When you do eventually speak, the water that comes spilling out is still contaminated, except this time it is mixed with a good dose of bitterness and resentment. And even when you don't speak, I think we all know that you don't have to use words to communicate your anger, do you? You don't have to use words to hurt someone else. You can be angrily silent or silently angry. You can be passively aggressive or aggressively passive. It's not enough to be slow to speak. James calls us to address the root problem that can be traced back to the reservoir of our hearts. And therefore, he calls us to be slow to anger. And what does James mean when he says be slow to anger? Notice, like with speech, James doesn't say don't be angry. He says be slow to anger because anger in and of itself is not a bad thing. Jesus himself was angry, Mark chapter 3 verse 5. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And then Paul goes on to talk about God's anger against godliness and unrighteousness, Romans 1.18. 
Romans 1.18, for the wrath, meaning the anger of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of humankind. Jesus was angry. God the Father was angry. Jesus, James isn't saying that all anger is bad. He's contrasting between two types of anger. Two types of anger. The sinful anger of man that does not produce the righteousness of God and the righteousness of God that does produce the righteousness of God. We see that distinction in verse 20 of, of James chapter 1. For the anger of humans does not produce the righteousness of God. James makes this distinction here, and that's why he calls us to be slow to anger so that we give ourselves the time and the space to ensure that what is driving us is godly anger and not sinful anger. And actually, in these verses, James gives us guidance on how to differentiate between the two, between sinful anger and godly anger. Sinful anger is often the first anger. The quick anger, the anger that comes bubbling up immediately and instinctively when something happens the way we don't want it to happen. We've all felt that before. This first anger is not always sinful, but it's so hard, isn't it, in the moment, in the heat of the moment, to know what is what. And so we need to be slow to anger, to let things cool down, to let the dust settle, to let the mist dissipate. Secondly, sinful anger is anger that produces sin, that does not produce the righteousness of God. Verse 20 again, for the anger of man, sinful anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Sinful anger can be identified by the sin that it produces. Thoughts and feelings and actions that are in opposition to right living and right relationships with God that God calls us to. It doesn't matter whether we feel or even are justified in our anger, if that anger leads to sin, to slander, to gossip, to harshness, to violence, to lying, to bitterness, to lack of self-control, to silently sulking, then that is still sinful anger, isn't it? And, and this is so important for us to take on board. Sometimes in our anger, when we feel we are justified in our anger, we then feel that we are justified to do whatever we want with our anger. I'm in the right here, you know. I'm the one who has been wronged. You listen to me and you take what I give you. We feel that when we are justified, we almost have like a blank check to do or say whatever we want to do. But that's not how it works here. James makes clear for us, regardless of the reason, regardless of the motive, if anger leads to sin, then it has become sinful anger. Thirdly, sinful anger is deaf anger. James 1.19, again, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak. Sinful anger is deaf anger because it is slow to hear and quick to speak. Sinful anger blocks our ears so that we don't listen to the perspective and counsel of others. Sinful anger hardens our hearts so that we are not open to the guidance or instruction or even correction of others. Proverbs 18 verse 13, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. 19 verse 20 of Proverbs, listen to advice and accept instruction. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Righteous anger, in contrast, righteous anger, godly anger, in contrast to sinful anger, has open ears to hear before answering and a soft heart to accept advice and guidance and even correction. One of the best pieces of advice I've received on listening well is that we should be able to summarize the other person's perspective in such a way that they would say that we have heard them. Notice that doesn't mean that we agree with them, but it does mean that we are able to say it back to them 
in such a way that they say, yes, you have heard me. But James continues, sinful anger doesn't just close its ears to the words of others, it closes its ears to the words of God. Verse 21, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Sinful anger doesn't just box other people out, sinful anger boxes God out. It is unwilling and unable to receive with meekness the implanted word of God. But if you think about how to apply this, how the rubber meets the road, I think it's important to acknowledge that some of us work in environments or live in environments where meekness is a weakness, where brashness and aggression are valued, even rewarded. Phrases like, you've got to crack an egg to make an omelette. You need to say what needs to be said to get the job done. And I don't want to diminish the tension that we face in these environments, but even as we face that tension, we need to realize there is a tension. It's not just one extreme. It's not easy and it needs a lot of God-given wisdom, but God's Word is clear that we need to spend time working through what it looks like to be effective where we work and where we live, while at the same time having the meekness to receive God's implanted word. It's not one or the other. If the way we are living means that we are no longer meek, we, do not, we no longer have the meekness to receive God's implanted word, then the pendulum is swung to the other extreme. When James talks about the implanted word in verse 21, he's echoing verses 17 to 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. That's the echo there, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This word of truth, God's word, God's implanted word, even as we trace the theme of wholeness in James, we can trace the concurrent theme of God's word of truth that is the means to our wholeness. Anger that is unwilling to receive God's word of truth is not of God. Anger that is unwilling to seek the Lord in prayer or that even finds itself hiding from God is not of God. And maybe we need to ask ourselves, have we found ourselves in that situation before? When we're so angry that we find ourselves boxing God out, reluctant to pray, reluctant to even open God's Word or even spend time with God's people. Faith that produces wholeness is faith that is slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to hear the words of others and the words of God. But even as we are called to be hearers of God's Word, we are also called to be doers of God's Word, which is our second point, hearing and doing. After telling us to be quick to listen to God's Word, James now teaches us how to listen well to God's Word. As one commentator puts it, after warning us against action without listening, now James calls us, warns us against listening without action. Rightly hearing God's Word will lead to doing God's Word. Verse 22, but be doers of the Word not only, not, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Before I get ready to preach, I need to look at my appearance in the mirror. Does what I'm wearing look okay? Did I miss a button? Happened before. <laughs> Is there anything in my teeth? Again, happened before. <laughs> Is my hair sticking out funny? 
Because that's what mirrors are for, aren't they? Mirrors show us what needs to change in our appearance. And that's what James is talking about here. God's Word, James says, is like a mirror that shows us what needs to change. Except God's Word reflects more than just our physical appearance, it reflects to us our hearts. What is beneath our physical appearance and what needs to change there? We saw that happening in verses 19 to 21. When God's Word revealed to us the need to do something about our speech, perhaps even our anger. And I'm sure that for some of us here, even as we went through those verses, we felt that nudge, didn't we? That, that tugging in our hearts where God's Spirit is using God's Word to point out that perhaps not all is well for us in that department. We saw that happening last week as we talked about how do we, how, how, how can we respond rightly when things don't go the way we want to. Again, I'm sure for many of us, we felt that, that, that gentle nudge, sometimes less gentle nudge of God's Spirit on our hearts that suggests maybe this is something we need to pay attention to. God's Word, when rightly heard, leads to change. Because God's Word, when rightly heard, calls for change. And therefore, if you're hearing it rightly, that call needs to lead to action. Changes in our thoughts, feelings, and actions in our heads, hearts, and hands. This is really important for us to pay attention to as a church. As a church, at Christ City, we seek to always be scripture-based, gospel-centered, always under the authority of the, of the preaching and teaching of God's revealed word. And that is good. Praise God for that. But you know what happens often in, in churches that focus so much on rightly hearing God's word is that sometimes we focus on the hearing and not enough on the doing. We look at other churches and we go, they just do, they don't hear. Well, if we hear and not do, there's something wrong with us too. Rightly hearing God's word is revealed in rightly doing God's word. Otherwise, and James uses very strong language here, we're just deceiving ourselves. Christ City, how have we been doing God's word this week? Can you think of something? Or does the mind go blank? Not just doing God's Word once, like Tuesday at 4 p.m., but persevering in consistently doing it. Verse 25, uh, James writes, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. You can almost imagine James, as he writes this sentence about the importance of doing God's word, thinking to himself, wait, I, sh I better put in something about persevering. So, they don't, so that they don't get the wrong idea, so they know exactly what to expect. Because doing God's work, doing God's word is no walk in the park. It takes perseverance. God's word will tell us things that are hard to hear, and God's word will tell us things that are hard to do. And therefore, James wants us to remember that even as we need to do God's word, we need to persevere in hearing and doing God's word over and over again. But James doesn't stop there. Even as you can imagine him going, I better write in something about perseverance. Then he's, he, he, he just adds some, you can imagine him saying, oh, now I better tell them that it's worth it. <laughs> Even as he tells us we need to persevere, he reassures us that it's worth it. Verse 25, look at, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, what does James write? He will be blessed in his doing. As a kid, I remember playing games involving treasure maps where, you know, someone draws up a treasure map and everyone else has to follow the directions to find the hidden treasure. And that's actually what's going on here. We have, what we have in God's Word is a treasure map. 
It isn't just meant to be read or understood or even memorized. It's meant to be followed. Because it is only by following God's Word, doing God's Word, that we will find the treasures and blessings of wholeness that God wants to lead us to. The treasure map is not meant to be framed up on the wall and shown off. It's not just meant to be memorized. It's meant to be followed because it's only by following the directions of the map that we will find the treasure. In Christ City, there is a treasure waiting for us. Don't hear in these words condemnation telling us how much we have failed. Uh, Hear the guidance of a loving God who loves us and gives us His Word and gives us His Spirit so that we may find that treasure. So hearing and speaking, hearing and doing, and third point, thinking and doing. One of my core memories growing up is visiting night markets, both in Singapore where I grew up and in other cities across Southeast Asia. And night markets in my neck of the woods always have at least two things. They have normally lots of other things, but at least two things. Really good food, that's often not very good for you, and counterfeit goods, (laughs) meaning imitation goods. And often, you have to give it to them. They don't even try to pass off as the real thing. It's Nike just done it. (laughs) Adidas with too many stripes. Rolex watches made of plastic and probably spelt with different letters. Anyone who knows anything with one look knows that these are counterfeit. They're just imitations of the real thing. But then you have other goods that, unless you knew what you were looking for, most people wouldn't be able to tell that they're not the real thing. And that's what James is doing for us here about faith. Even as James teaches us about genuine faith that leads to wholeness, he teaches us about how to identify counterfeit faith, imitation faith that tries to pass off as the real thing, but ultimately leads to brokenness and destruction. Verse 26, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. It's counterfeit. It does not work. It's just an imitation. The zipper is going to break. It's going to fall apart the first time you use it. You put it in water and it's going to fall apart. And what James does is that he comes back to the topic of speech and he puts a finer point on it. No matter how much we know, how much others know we know, how mature we think we are, the true state of our faith is revealed in what we say and how we talk to others. Blomberg and Coalition issue this caution that is so relevant to leaders in the church that I've been mulling over because it's so relevant for me. This is what they say. Here is a caution for Christian leaders to take particularly to heart. Because so much of their ministry involves speaking, it would be unrealistic to be commanded to speak little. But they can always try to think first. Hear other people's perspectives and have their tempers under control before they speak. We need to be clear about what James is saying here, though. James is not calling us to constantly second-guess the genuineness of our faith or to enter a spiral of self-doubt every time we say something we shouldn't. That's not what he's doing here. What James is saying, what he's been saying throughout this letter, and we'll continue to say throughout this letter, is that, if we are, is that while we are saved by faith alone, that faith is never alone. Genuine faith always works itself out by doing God's Word to change our lives in the direction of wholeness. Now, that change isn't immediate. There'll be ups and there'll be downs. We will continue to say things we shouldn't. But over time, there will be a noticeable change 
as truly hearing God's word necessarily leads to doing God's word. In contrast, religion that is worthless, that is counterfeit, is empty and useless, like a car that looks good but doesn't move. So let's flesh out what this means for us practically. Firstly, Christian faith is not whatever we want it to be. Like those goods in the night market, there is genuine faith and there is counterfeit faith. And God in His kindness reveals to us what genuine faith looks like and smells like and feels like so that we know whether we have the real thing. You know what's worse than having a counterfeit faith? Having a counterfeit faith and not knowing about it. But that's not all that God is doing here. He's not just telling us how to differentiate between counterfeit faith and genuine faith. He then teaches us how to use the genuine faith that we already have. Like a child who's been given a new gift that he doesn't know how to use, we need our Heavenly Father to teach us how to use the gift that He has given us. Those don't see in these words just criteria for us to differentiate between genuine and counterfeit. See here loving guidance from our Father who says, this faith that I have given you, this is how it should work. This is how it should work. Secondly, our actions reveal our faith. The order is important here. Actions do not earn our faith. Actions reveal our faith. When we are sick, we know that the medicine is working. When the symptoms go away, and God tells us it's the same with our faith, we know that our faith is working when there is change in our lives. When we put off the old and we put on the new, Faith changes us to become more like God. And so, if after one year, five years, ten years, you don't look anything more like God, maybe we need to be asking ourselves, what are we clothing ourselves with? Who are we clothing ourselves with? This is why Christian community is so important. Community is the context in which our faith is revealed. So many of the commands in the Bible on how to live out our faith, they are commands that have to be done in community because they are commands that are about treating how we treat each other. When it talks about being quick to listen and slow to speak, it's not talking about yourself. It's talking about how we listen to others and how we speak to others. The instruction to control our speech assumes that we are talking to people. And you know what? It actually assumes that we will have people who will point out to us lovingly, hopefully, when maybe our speech misses the mark. Baked into all of James's guidance here is the assumption that we are in community that is willing to speak and receive the truth in love with one another. What does our speech reveal about our faith? What does our speech reveal about our faith? Not just with people that we want to think well of us. How about the people who we have nothing to gain in talking to. Not just our peers and our supervisors, how about our subordinates? And do we have people in our lives who we have given permission to point out blind spots and areas in our lives that miss the mark? Do we have that? If you don't have that and you want to think about how to cultivate that, come and talk to me. And I'd be happy to to walk you through how can you begin to do that. Third thing we learn is that our actions have consequences. And in some sense, James is just stating the obvious here. When you say something nasty, your religion becomes useless. 
It becomes worthless in the eyes of others. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, how much Bible trivia you know, how many books you've read, all of that becomes instantly worthless the moment you speak harshly to others and lash out with your words. When your mouth becomes a weapon to bully and tear others down, no one has any time for anything you want to say about your God. But even as James tells us what worthless religion looks like, he goes on to tell us what true, pure religion looks like. Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Throughout the Bible, God's heart for the weak and the vulnerable is revealed time and time again. Luke 4, 17, when Jesus explained his ministry on earth, this is what he said. Jesus unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Psalm 146 verse 9, the Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. Or how about Deuteronomy 10 verse 18? He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. James tells us that genuine faith is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction because genuine faith clothes us with God's concern for the weak and the vulnerable. And that's not all. Genuine faith leads us to helping the weak and the vulnerable because genuine faith recognizes that that is what God has done for us. When we were weak, when we were vulnerable, when we are still weak, when we are still vulnerable, God executes and justice for and continues to love us. The heart of the gospel is God's heart for the helpless and that helpless includes us. That's why our 1018 ministry run by Johan, built on Deuteronomy 1018, is such an important ministry, isn't it? And that's why we're also so excited about this opportunity to move ahead with our urban chapel in the downtown east side. But even as we celebrate these things, we need to be careful here. We need to be careful that just because someone else in our church is doing it, we don't have to do it ourselves. This is not like some responsibility we can outsource, like getting someone else to do our taxes. These ministries are not about us giving responsibility to someone else. These are about giving ourselves opportunities to carry out the God-given responsibility God has given each of us to do. But we also need to be clear about one other thing. Genuine faith is not only about helping the weak and the vulnerable. It may sound a bit like that in our verses, but that's because that's the way wisdom literature was written. But that's not all that is happening here. We see that in the context of James as a letter as a whole, but we also see this in our verse. We look at verse 27 again. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to what? And to keep oneself unstained from the world. Again, when you think about James writing this verse, he talks about how it's so important to have God's heart for the helpless and the vulnerable. And then he thinks to himself, I should add one more thing, lest people think this is the only thing there is. And so he adds, and to keep oneself unstained from the world, meaning to continue to clothe ourselves, not with the values of the world, but with the character of God. James exhorts us, don't settle for a faith that just claims to be the real thing. Live into a faith that changes us to become more like God as we are clothed with God's character. A faith that is slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to anger. A faith that doesn't just hear God's word, but also does God's word and doesn't just think it is genuine, but actually brings us into wholeness in Christ. If you're able, please stand as we respond to God's word together.